Oh my god, that is much heavier than that looks. Oh hey, sorry guys about the mess, I didn't even see you guys come in. Just been to a recent expedition in the Amazon and kind of sort of met some indigenous villagers and um, sort of ended up taking their most prized religious artifacts. But hey, it's not as if they were using them, they were just kind of lying there and anyone could just go up and take them. So I'm sure they won't miss them or anything, I'm definitely sure that curses don't exist in real life. Ah, I'm sure it's fine. Not everyone, though, can go on heroic adventures like me and take people's shit from other countries. Some of us had to rely on video games to do that for us. Since the beginning, gaming has continually evolved to deliver truly engaging and immersive experiences. It allowed us to live out some of our greatest fantasies, embark on adventures we could only dream of, and help to bring to life some of the most memorable stories and characters in gaming history. The 80s was all about the 2D games, but it really wasn't until the 90s that 3D games started to become a thing. People saw the direction the industry was going in, were really excited for the potential that new hardware had to allow them to create bigger and more ambitious games. For the first time, games could be designed to mimic real-life locations, or bring spectacular fantasy worlds to life in more immersive ways than ever before. It really was the dawn of a new era which saw beloved franchises evolve, as well as the success and rise of brand new IPs. One of the best success stories of this era was a game that came completely out of nowhere in 1996, made by a small English development studio in Derby called Core Design. The game was Tomb Raider, an action-adventure game that completely revolutionised 3D gaming, changed how gaming was perceived in popular culture, and also gave birth to gaming's first lady, Lara Croft. In this series, I'm going to be taking a look at all the main entries in the franchise from Tomb Raider 1, right up until Rise of the Tomb Raider, and then later Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I'm going to be giving a more personal account of my journey through all of these titles, but I'm also going to be going into how well these games actually hold up, and also how easy they are to revisit. So strap in folks as we take a look at the one that started the whole thing, the Book of Genesis from the Bible of Croft, Tomb Raider, starring Lara Croft. The game opens with a pre-rendered cutscene depicting an explosion in the New Mexico desert that ends up unearthing a strange device containing what looks like to be a person frozen in ice. Straight after that, we jump ahead to the present day in Calcutta, where we're introduced to our leading lady, who is relaxing in a hotel lobby before she's presented with a magazine that has the headline, Lara Stamps Out Bigfoot. So already we know that Lara's badass, because not only has she found Bigfoot, she's likely killed the thing in order to add as a coffee table to her trophy room. She's then approached by a rival treasure hunter working for a business tycoon called Jacqueline Natler, who wants to hire her services to recover an artifact called the Skion of Atlantis from the lost tomb of Qualapec in Peru. Feast your eyes on this, Lara. How does that make your wallet rumble? I'm sorry, I only play for sport. Or if she needs a new futon for the smoking lounge. You could leave tomorrow. Are you busy tomorrow? After that, we arrive at the game's main menu screen, and here you can choose to start a new game, load a save, or even visit Lara's home. And the decision to turn Lara's home into its own level was a stroke of genius, because while it may be just a glorified tutorial level, Croft Manor has become as much of an icon as Lara herself, and has been an integral part of Lara's character ever since its inclusion. What's even more impressive is that this level was designed, built, and completed by Toby Guard in just a weekend, and having this level be totally optional also means that players who are already familiar with the game didn't have to suffer through annoying tutorials on repeat play throughs. Twilight Princess, anyone? Not only that, it also helped develop the character of Lara Croft into a real person who lives in an actual house in the English countryside, and not just paint her as a faceless avatar for the player to take control of. Here you're allowed free reign to explore the manor and given ample room to practice the game's controls in a risk-free environment. Run up to a crate. Well... mostly. There are several boxes you can use for practicing climbing, rooms to explore, and even a full gymnasium with a swimming pool to use to practice the game's various different maneuvers. All of this while Lara addresses you directly, acting as both house tour guide and advisor on the game's controls. Use the D-pad to go into the music room, run up to a crate, and while still pressing forward, press action and I'll vault up onto it. This used to be the ballroom, but I've converted it into my own personal gym. What do you think? I can't climb up because the gap is too small, but press right and I'll shimmy sideways until there is room. Then press forward. The jump button and the directions move me around underwater. 
I especially like the explanation that she gives for all the boxes being scattered around in the main hall, and it's a great example of how such a small detail can have a big effect on world building. Ah, uh, the main hall. Sorry about the crates. I'm having some things put into storage and the delivery people haven't been yet. It's obvious that the developers put these crates here purely for the purpose of practicing the game's controls, but having Lara explain to the player that they're there to be put away in storage goes a long way into making her seem like an actual character with a life outside of the main game. After choosing to start a new game, we see Lara arrive at the entrance to the game's first tomb in Peru, and here she's wearing her iconic outfit that's totally appropriate attire for being in the snow-covered Himalayas and wouldn't in any way help induce hypothermia. Oh no, wait, she's got a scarf, it's fine. Forget what I said. She scales the wall to work out how to open it, but as soon as she does, the doors open and unleash a pack of wolves, who proceed to feast upon her Peruvian guide like a chicken wing. Now totally isolated and likely freezing cold, she enters the tomb, the doors close behind her, she gives us the Sean Connery eyebrow, and it's from here the game truly begins. Alright, here we go. I am Lara Croft Tomb Raider, badass adventurer, treasure hunter, and wearer of teal lycra. Time to begin my adventure and raid some tombs. Ow! What the hell was that? A blow darts? Really? You mean to tell me that there's someone that's been waiting for me this whole time behind those walls? Sure, I know it's more of a slap on the wrist than an actual threat, but having this ambush waiting for you right at the beginning teaches you to always pay attention to your surroundings. There's no obvious indication on where you need to go or what you need to do to get there. Instead, you're expected to rely completely on your own observational skills and lateral thinking to work it out for yourself. There are occasions where the game's camera will throw you a bone and focus on certain objects or locations to help guide you, but for most of the time it's just you and the game. And that's it. Which I really admire this game for. They could have easily just flashed up a text box on screen telling you what your objective was like in Mario 64, but it's clear that immersing the player to their surroundings was the primary focus for the developers when designing this game. In fact, the only on-screen information conveyed to you is just how much health and ammo you have left, and even that is designed to take up as little screen real estate as possible. This means that the game's environments could take centre stage, and it provides you with a clear view of your surroundings at all times in order to navigate them effectively, as well as visually prepare you for any incoming obstacles the game would throw at you. And it would throw a lot at you, believe me, so you need to be able to see absolutely everything in order to be able to react to it in time. There is a lot of responsibility placed on the player's shoulders when controlling Lara. You are responsible for avoiding traps. You are the one that has to tell Lara when to draw her weapons and fight back. You are the one that has to tell her when to heal or to do that weird tumble she does to turn around that to this day I still can't work out what it is she's actually doing. Even something as simple as when to grab onto a ledge was dictated by the player as you had to remember to hold down the grab button before you hit that ledge otherwise you'd smack straight into it and plummet to your death which would happen a lot. Considering most people were used to platformers only having two or so buttons to worry about, this level of control was almost completely unheard of at the time. Sure, at first it felt kind of daunting, but when you got into the game's groove and mastered these controls, my god was it satisfying to pull these moves off. For the first time, players had the ability to walk, sidestep, run, jump, grab ledges, shimmy, somersault, dive, swan dive, vault up ledges, whatever this is, pull blocks, pull switches, quick turn, shoot, and swim, all in a fully interactive 3D environment. I know looking back at it, the graphics don't seem all that impressive, especially with Lara's infamous Toblerone titties on display, but when you consider that this game came out at a point where games had just started to move from 2D to 3D, this was incredibly impressive for the time. To put it into perspective, it took over 5,000 frames of animation just to bring Lara to life, when other 3D games at the time would use a lot less and for multiple objects. Of course you can't have tombs without having secrets to find, and this game has a load of them to find. Often if you kept an eye out for a secret ledge, or a hidden switch, you'll be rewarded with a room containing extra medkits, special ammo, and even early access to weapons. Yes, Tomb Raider wasn't just about exploring caves and jumping gaps, as Lara had to defend herself from the various forms of hostile wildlife. Creatures like bats, wolves, crocodiles, bears, lions, panthers, harambe, a T-Rex... Wait, what? Yeah, I am not even joking! The third level of this game has Lara fighting fucking dinosaurs! I can't even begin to tell you how completely out of nowhere this was. It's like if you were playing a level of Super Mario World, went through a warp pipe, and then all of a sudden ended up in Metal Gear's Outer Heaven. Or, if you were playing a game by EA, and then found out suddenly that it wasn't a game that was completely trying to rip you off. Each enemy attacks you on sight and can be dodged with a well-timed somersault or taken out by circle strafing with one of the four weapons at Lara's disposal. You start with Lara's signature 
with pistols which had a limited ammo, but later you were able to find a shotgun, some magnums, and a pair of Uzis, all of which had to have their ammo collected separately around each level, either in secret rooms or tucked away in a corner somewhere. Thankfully you don't have to manually aim or hold a button down to lock onto an enemy's position like you would do in, say, Ocarina of Time, as the game does this all for you, leaving you free to keep the fire button held down and to manage your movement. This is great for dealing with single enemies, but when faced with a group this can sometimes leave you at the mercy of what the game thinks is the bigger threat, and unfortunately there's no easy way to switch targets. Should you be walking around with your weapon drawn and an enemy appears, the game's camera will instantly focus on them, and Lara will even point her guns towards them, and let me tell you, her being able to give you such a clear visual cue for something like this is an absolute godsend, because this game's camera has a habit of not showing you the thing you're supposed to be shooting at half the time. Being able to see where you're going is one of, if not the most important part of any 3D game. For the most part, the camera in Tomb Raider is pretty competent. It shows the player all they needed, whilst allowing them to be able to judge gap distances, spot hazardous obstacles, and avoid incoming threats. Unfortunately, where this starts to fall apart a little is in the combat scenarios, where enemies can run around Lara so fast it often causes the camera to violently spin around you and completely disorientate you. What's worse is when you end up backed into a corner by a group of enemies, the camera decides to default to a front angle of Lara, making it practically impossible to see anything she's fucking shooting at. This can often lead to multiple instances where your best tactic is to frantically jump around like a madman and hold down the fire button and hope for the best. That's not to say that the combat in this game is bad, it just takes a little getting used to in order to get good at it. Don't forget, for its time, this level of maneuverability was totally unheard of in a 3D game, and being able to take out a group of enemies with a well-timed side flip whilst unloading a large number of bullets into them is extremely satisfying. Not only that it plays into the persona of Lara Croft the badass by letting players feel like they were the ones putting off these combat maneuvers. It's an empowering game and it clearly defines Lara as a person that is more than capable of being able to take care of herself in the face of danger. And that is just as well as you'll be faced with a lot of danger not just from the various wildlife <coughs> but also from the levels themselves. Traps are frequently scattered everywhere in Tomb Raider, and often you'll be punished severely for being careless and not paying attention to your surroundings. There are spike pits to fall in, swinging blades that slice you, serrated doors that can crush you, fire jets that can burn you, boulders that can flatten you, and believe me, we'll get to see more of those another day, and countless high ledges to fall from that make Lara scream like a 50s housewife that's discovered a spider in her kitchen. <laughs> In fact, I guarantee that you will hear this sound and that scream several times in one playthrough of this game, because you will die a lot and lose a lot of progress either by accident or because of circumstances beyond your control. Which brings me to possibly my single worst gripe with this game, and that is the save system. Oh god, the save system. As if this game wasn't tough enough for new players to beat, but they also had to contend with one of the most inconvenient and extremely punishing save systems in gaming history. Why? Well, the way you save this game is that you walk up to these giant floating crystals at a particular location in a level and use them like you would do an item in order to let you save the game. This would be fine if these crystals could be used more than once, but they're only a one-time use. One. Fucking. Time. Considering that this game's levels are long and often full of lots of backtracking, having a one-time save system like this means that if you chose to save at a certain point and then realised afterwards that you were going the wrong way, you've effectively wasted that save point and doubled your backtracking. Oh, but it gets better. Not only are these save points consumable, but you also only have one save slot available to save your progress to and have to overwrite your previous save. Meaning if you chose to save and it was the wrong time to do so, you've either got to put up with effectively handicapping yourself or restart the whole fucking level. It's just such a weird system to have in a game like this. You're always in a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situation. And I don't think I've ever played a game outside of this series that makes you both dread and look forward to saving your game. As a result, every jump you make, room you enter, or puzzle you have to solve now has this extra layer of danger on top of it. Which, I guess could be what they were going for, but there are plenty of other ways that they could have done this without making the game just flat out unfair. For example, for example, the PC version does away with save crystals entirely and allows you to quick save multiple times at any point in the game. And I cannot even begin to tell you how much better this is than the console version. It's actually quite similar in concept to Resident Evil, where you could only save at certain locations in a limited number of times. Only that was a survival horror game, and restricting the player to add tension was part of the whole 
idea. Anyways, after you reach the end of the fourth level, you pick up the first piece of the Skion, and as you escape from the whole temple collapsing around you, you're ambushed by Larson, who has a shotgun. But if you're smart like me, and you found the shotgun earlier, you can waste him in about 30 seconds. Surviving the several shotgun blasts to the chest, he tells Lara that Natla sent him to kill her and recover the piece of Skion that she found. He also mentions that a second piece is in the other part of the world, being tracked down by a rival treasure hunter, who was a man with a name so French he might as well be called Monsieur Baguette au Chocolat sous la table. Or something. I really don't know French. Afterwards, Lara pays a visit to Natla's office in, I presume, America, and discovers that the location of the next piece is in Greece, and that Pierre has already had a few days head start on finding it. Greece is the second location of the game, and it's from here where the level design starts to get more creative and complex. The first level is a great example of this, where you start off in a small temple-like structure that only has a few blocks to climb on, only to then be faced with a gigantic room with a multi-leveled structure a few minutes later. This room was both breathtaking and ridiculous to a point where it'd almost be tempted to call this the best designed room in the game. Why? Well, not only does its design encourage you to make full use of the environment, but just look at this thing! Looks like someone tried to build this thing with giant Tetris blocks. There are also several sub-rooms named after Greek gods that have totally unique traps and puzzles based on their mythology. Oh, sorry, my mistake, unless you count Thor as part of the mythology. Either that or he pulled a Kratos and secretly became part of the Greek pantheon. As the levels go on, Lara continues to get more items, pull more levers, and do battle with more creatures in their natural habitats, who all instantly attack her, likely out of fear of being turned into a new drinks cabinet. Oh yeah, and you bump into Pierre a few times, and he can show up at the most annoying of times just to piss you off. Often you'll be in the middle of climbing something or trying to navigate a tricky jump, and then suddenly in he comes with his magnums and takes several chunks of health away or outright kills you, making you lose several minutes of progress. You can't kill him either, at least not at this stage, and he doesn't go away until you deal enough damage to him. It's actually kind of hilarious that you can fill him with more lead than an extra in a John Woo movie, and yet he's still able to sprint away and keep coming back for more. Dude's more resilient and stubborn than the fucking T-1000. You also can't dodge his attacks either, because like all the enemies in the game that use guns, he uses hit scanning in order to attack you, and it's impossible to avoid unless you run around a corner or get behind cover. Thankfully these fights are few and far between, as they're easily the worst thing about the combat in this game. Game. But they do serve as a decent end level challenge and are used sparingly enough so as to not become too annoying. I suppose now is a good time to talk about the excellent sound design in this game and its awesome soundtrack composed by Nathan McCree. It's perhaps one of my favourite soundtracks of all time and even I dare say one of the best video game soundtracks ever made. It really does an excellent job of emphasising the sense of wonder and spectacle that comes with discovering a lost city untouched for several centuries or happening upon a tomb of a long forgotten king that's covered in gold and jewels. Even the music that plays during the combat segments is amazing. Just listen to the tune that plays when fighting these wolves. You just know that you are in deep shit when you hear this track. And I bet if you were to ask someone to name a track that they remember from this game, aside from the main theme, that track would be the one. Oh, let's not forget about the main theme of this game, a theme that to this day still perfectly represents the character of Lara Croft and captures the sense of wonder and discovery that Tomb Raider is all about. Instead of bombastic orchestral pieces like you would hear in something like Final Fantasy, Nathan instead decided to create something that focused on atmosphere and is played sparingly. Just everything about this soundtrack is perfect, and even listening to it now is just giving me chills. Just love it. It's clear that the developers really wanted to immerse you into your surroundings, as aside from an echoey ambience track, all you're left with is the sound of Lara's footsteps, the occasional animal noise, the many instances of gunfire, and the many, many grunts and groans that Lara makes when climbing and jumping. I'm not even exaggerating when I say that she makes these oddly sexual sounding noises every time she either vaults up a ledge or pushes and pulls any blocks and these sounds are almost always louder than anything else playing at the time. And this is by no means a slight on the performance of Shelley Blonde, the voice actress for Lara, as she gives one of, if not the best portrayals of Lara Croft. But you tell me without any visual context that listening to these sounds doesn't make it sound like you're playing something a little bit... <laughs> um, risque. <laughs> Ugh. <sighs>
but my favourite sound in the whole game has to be the sound that she makes when you try to use an item in the wrong place. It's hilarious. No. I don't know what it is, it just cracks me up every time I hear it. No. Maybe it's because the line is delivered with such a high level of no. casual sass and apathy to it. It sounds like Lara herself is no. in genuine disbelief that you were stupid enough to even think that this item combination was a viable option. No. Sounds like my wife whenever I ask her, how do I look? Or how about tonight we watch The Amazing Bulk? No. Eventually, after four more levels and a surprise battle with a statue that turns out to be a skinless centaur, I mean, we've all been there, right girls? You arrive at the resting place of the next piece of the ski on and run into Pierre again, only this time you can actually kill him and take his magnums for yourself. Or again, if you're enough of a psychopath like me, you found these three levels ago in a secret room that involved a timed door and an invisible trigger and a jumping puzzle. Yep, I have way too much spare time. The next area takes you to Egypt, where the difficulty really starts to bend you over a barrel and hit you in the ass and expects you to say, please sir, some more. Here is where we're introduced to the Atlanteans, and oh ho, 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 boy. I hate these pricks. They usually appear completely out of nowhere and attack so fast and frantically they can practically kill you within seconds if you have anything less than full health. And remember early when I mentioned about the camera in this game and how it can sometimes be hard to see what's attacking you? Well, these enemies are where the game's camera officially just gives up. By this point, you are often faced with multiple Atlantean creatures who easily run circles around you and it's just barely able to keep up with everything. Or it just flat out goes, fuck this shit, and turns the camera around on Lara, meaning you can't see what you're shooting at. And unless you know this game inside out or have recently played it, you will never be prepared to take these guys on. Your only option is to get as much distance between you and them as possible, but good luck with doing that because even if by some miracle you somehow manage to get any distance away from them, they start shooting red hot fireballs at you like Dragon Ball Z key blasts. And if you do eventually manage to take one of these guys out and just happen to be close, then guess what? They fucking explode! What? kind of sense does that make? I mean, okay, I get that it's a creature that's completely made up and not everything in this game has to make sense, but can you just imagine how inconvenient this would be if you were an Atlantean in this universe? Like, just imagine for a second that you're a regular Atlantean with a regular wholesome Atlantean family, you have a few kids and a white picket fence, and just as you move off the driveway to go to work, you accidentally run over an Atlantean cat and then... BAM! Or perhaps when you're working on a building site, you get distracted for a moment by some hot Atlantean piece of ass and you slip and fall to your death. BOOM! Can you just imagine what hospitals would have been like in Atlantis when everyone explodes on their death? Just imagine you're on your deathbed surrounded by your family, everyone is saying their final goodbyes whilst trying to hold back the tears of pure unbridled sorrow, and then out of nowhere, BAM! Fucking destroyed! It gets even worse when you start fighting groups of these guys at the same time, as they just explode and limbs fly everywhere like it's the 4th of July at fucking Eli Roth's house. So by now you've just thrown all tactics out the window and decided to employ what I call the Lara Croft hopscotch, which is to constantly jump back and forth in four directions whilst keeping the fire button held down and hoping for the best. And get used to seeing more of these guys, by the way, because from here on out the game starts to dive more into fantasy territory. And these enemies are just the beginning. Later on, Larson shows up again only to get turned into Swiss cheese by a pair of magical floating Uzis. And after collecting the final piece of the ski on, Lara gets ambushed by Natla and her goons who take away all of her stuff. Narrowly escaping with her life, she chases Natla down on her motorcycle and performs one of the most ridiculous and badass stunts in gaming history. <laughs> is amazing. Now we enter the last three levels of the game, and they're easily my favourite of the whole lot. The first is a scavenger hunt for all of your weapons around an abandoned mine and a showdown with each of Natla's goons, which include, and I am not kidding, a cowboy, a kid on a skateboard, and a man that wikiraider.com refers to simply as bald guy who looks nothing like he does in this cutscene. The second level is ascending the Great Pyramid of Atlantis. And let me tell you, whoever decided to design these environments like this, you sir or madame, need help. Just look at this! This is definitely not what many people would think of when they hear the word Atlantis. They'd likely think of a sunken city with grand stone architecture, walls detailed with its own language, and technology light years beyond our own understanding. 
Not the inside of H.R. Geiger's ass. Instead, every surface here looks like it's made of body tissue with a muscular structure to it that you can actually see pulsing and moving. It's like, ah, oh, God. Oh. It's like I'm walking around inside of Orson Welles. I mean, what other games released at the time can you say that had levels that looked even remotely like this? Even the enemies here are in these ovary-like birthing pods until they burst out at you all shrieking and skinless. This tonal shift to horror completely blew me away, and it's just so brilliant at making you feel like you're exploring somewhere that's completely completely alien and really should have stayed buried. It's also here where the music almost completely drops out and instead the only soundtrack we get is this dull, repetitive, echoey thud of a giant pulsing heartbeat. As if this wasn't truly horrifying enough, you also have the pleasure of being trapped in a room with a fully skinless doppelganger known simply as Bacon Lara. I swear to God I didn't make this up either. That's what the fans refer to this character as. And no, I don't quite know why she has bones on her tits. And no, I don't know why she looks like someone skinned an ET and ran it through a printing press. But there she is, just staring right at you. <laughs> Unfortunately, Bacon Lara copies all of your movements and can't be killed by being shot at because it ends up damaging you as well. So you have to work out how to trick her into falling into a pit of lava so the door will open to the next room, which is honestly pretty easy. At one point here, I even managed to break the game. Somehow me running off this ledge made Bacon Lara fall to her death, but instead of it killing her, she somehow got stuck in the floor and was still alive. And I couldn't kill her or leave the room, so I had to load an old save and do the whole thing. Again. Finally, you reach the top of the pyramid where the Skion is on a pedestal being used to power the whole thing. Natla walks out and explains her evil plan to force the next evolution of the human race, blah, 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 whatever, yeah, next. Lara threatens to shoot the Skion, which causes Natla to Terry take her off a ledge, but of course Lara survives and Natla plummets to her death. As Lara starts climbing back up, you hear the faint sound of a countdown and the camera dramatically pans up to a gigantic birthing pod. And unless you've played this game before, you will never guess what comes out of that thing. It's a huge creature with a tiny head, giant torso, no legs, that pulls itself along the floor with its freakishly long arms. So basically, it's Steven Seagal. So naturally, you start circle strafing and trying really hard not to do this, and you end up defeating Seagal with good old-fashioned bullets and he explodes. Oh, but he doesn't just explode. He gets a whole dramatic death scene before he explodes. knows drama, I'll give him that. Eventually you climb back up to the ski on and finally destroy it, which in turn causes the whole pyramid to start collapsing around you. And just as you think you're about to make your escape, you find out that Nasla has not only survived her fall, but has also assumed her dragoon form, grown a gun on her arm and a pair of wings. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, there was a cutscene that explains that Nasla was originally one of the three rulers of Atlantis, but she got exiled in that pod theme from the very first cutscene because she created those abomination things. What a... Twist? So you shoot her several times, she finally dies, she gets back up again, you shoot her some more, she dies again, and then you slide down a really long slope to escape the pyramid. The game then ends with the whole island exploding and Lara sailing off into the sunsets on Natla's boat. So after everything that I've said about this game, does it hold up still? Yeah, actually, I think it does. Sure, it's a difficult game, and there were several times where I'd get so frustrated I'd almost give up, but it was also a really rewarding experience. From start to finish, this game pulls you into its world and brings its environments and the character of Lara Croft to life, never once taking you out of the whole experience. It's a game that, for me, will always hold a special place in my life, and it was one of the first games to challenge me in ways that I hadn't experienced before. If you're into your gaming history, then I do recommend you try and track down a copy of this game and play it, as it's one of those games that I feel everyone should experience it at least once. Compared to modern standards, yes, its tank controls and lack of analog stick support comes off as a little cumbersome and do make these games harder to revisit, but for the most part, Lara herself handles pretty well, with each movement being smooth and fluid and carrying a realistic sense of momentum to it without making her feel too heavy or too light. I personally recommend playing the PC or the Android releases of this game, though, as it not only has full controller support, but the save
save system is infinitely better than the sadistic save crystals used in the PlayStation and Saturn console versions. Even though a lot of people praise Mario 64 for its innovation in 3D platforming, Tomb Raider was the first real 3D interactive action-adventure game with gameplay that focused on character abilities, platforming and exploration and arguably did more to innovate 3D gaming than Mario did. To date, Tomb Raider 1 remains the most critically acclaimed game in the series, with over 7 million copies sold worldwide, and it also became one of the best-selling games for the PlayStation shortly after its release. And of course, with uh, a success like that, a sequel was inevitable, but um, I don't actually have a copy of Tomb Raider 2, but I heard that China's got one somewhere, so if you excuse me, I'm going to go off and try and track one down, so wish me luck! That is over. Uh, what the fuck? Oh shit! Gun. Gun. No. 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 On. Yeah, that's right. Fucking showed you, didn't I? Oh wait, they explode, don't they? <laughs>